Everybody hold your Bible in your hand. Let's make this confession together. I thank you, Father, that your word has the power to change my life. Today I give heed to it. I allow it to go into my ears, then into my mind, and then into my spirit. I'm a hearer of the word and a doer of the word, and I'll never be the same after today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Atmosphere. The atmosphere. What's happening around us? What's going on around us? How people feel around us? How people are able to relate to us and how we're able to relate to people in situations? That's what atmosphere is. An atmosphere was very important in the life and the ministry of Jesus. Jesus, if a lot of the things that Jesus does, and we wonder why did he do that? Why did he say that? Why did he why did he go here instead of going there? All has to do with Jesus creating the atmosphere atmosphere for the Spirit of God that was in him to be able to flow into situations. There's the, I had you turn to John chapter 11, and in John chapter 11, we have the account of Lazarus. Now, Lazarus is Jesus' friend, and the Bible says that Jesus loved Lazarus. So Mary and Martha, Lazarus' sisters, sent someone to tell Jesus that Lazarus was sick. And after getting that information, Jesus didn't do anything. And after two days, he told his disciples, let's go see Lazarus. And the disciples said, well, you know what happened last time we went to Bethany? The, um, the Jews almost killed us there. And uh, we don't want to go. And Jesus said, well, uh, Lazarus is asleep and I'm going to go wake him up. And they said, well, if he's asleep, isn't that a good thing? He can sleep this off. Isn't he going to recover? And that's when Jesus, the Bible doesn't say that Jesus rolled his eyes. That's the revised Corona translation says that. Jesus rolled his eyes and said, guys, actually Lazarus is dead. And Thomas, the man of faith and power, says, let's, let's all go with him. We're all going to die with him. But Jesus waits two days to go to see Lazarus. Now, why does he do that? If, if Jesus loves Lazarus, why didn't he leave right then and rush to his bedside to help him? The Bible is not clear about why he did that, but it had everything to do with the atmosphere that, was, that they were going to find when they got there. Jesus knew that Lazarus was dead. Actually, when they got there, it's a two-day journey from where Jesus was to where Lazarus was. And by the time that he got there, Lazarus was in the tomb. And Jesus knows who's going to be there, when the Pharisees are going to be there, when the mourners are going to be there, when Lazarus is in the tomb. And so Jesus, rather than rushing in and trying to do something right then, is concerned about who's going to be there, when are they going to be there, and what's the atmosphere going to be like. Because when he goes in, something powerful is going to happen. But in order for that power to flow, in, in order for the the powerful thing to happen that Jesus wants to happen, which is raising Lazarus from the dead. The atmosphere has to be correct. Everybody has to be in their place, even though they don't know they're a part of this. Jesus is setting up the atmosphere for this powerful miracle to happen. On a large scale, atmosphere was important to Jesus. And even on a smaller scale, atmosphere was important to Jesus. In Acts chapter 4, we have the story of Peter and John... Um, who were arrested, and when they stood in front of the judges, the Pharisees, to explain their situation, verse 13, Acts chapter 4, verse 13 says this, Now when they saw, when the Pharisees saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. Think about that. Just by talking with them, they realized that they had been with Jesus. They had been in the atmosphere of Jesus. That being around Jesus, pardon me, I need a handkerchief, please. It's freezing up here. That air conditioner is coming down on my bald head. I need a, I need a toboggan. Yeah, where's Riley? I want to buy his toboggan. Huh. 
But here it says that they realized that that Peter and John had been with Jesus. In other words, they had been in the atmosphere where Jesus was and it had affected them. So let me ask you this question. When people are around you, what do they get? There's a pastor. There's a, there's a traveling minister that I know who, has been, who came to Living Word a couple of times years ago, and his attitude was so critical and nasty. To sit at dinner with him, he would gossip and talk about other ministers and pastors and their shortcomings and things. And finally, I just told him in the car the last time he was here, I said, I'm not having you back. And he said, why? I said, because of your nasty attitude and the way you gossip about people. I said, you're... I said, I said, I understand that people in the body of Christ regard you as an elder statesman and you have all these people that are talking about how great you are. I can't stand to be around you. I actually told him this. I said, you gossiped about this pa- person and this person and that pastor and this great. If I told you some of the people he gossiped about and things that he said, you would, you would be aghast. At, really? He said all those things? And I said, I'm not. I said, unless you want to write a letter to the people who were w- at dinner with us last night and apologize for the things that you said. He said, I'm not apologizing for anything. I said, okay, that's up to you, but you're not coming back. Three years later... I was traveling through a town, and there was a pastor that I knew, and I just wanted to spend some time with him, called him up, hey, I'm driving through your town, you got time for lunch, we sat down for lunch, and I really like this guy. But the longer I was with him, the more I thought, where is this critical attitude coming from? He had an attitude about everybody, then he started talking about other pastors. I can't stand that when people gossip about, especially pastors gossiping about other pastors and they're standing in front of their congregations telling their congregations not to do it and it and it just you know i kept thinking wow this guy has really changed wonder what's going on with him and so part of the way through the lunch you know i i said so tell me what's been going on in your church he said oh man we had the best service he said two weeks ago we had so and so at our church and it was the guy that i told could not come back to our church He had been in the atmosphere of this minister, and it rubbed off on him. I could see it. When he mentioned that guy's name, I thought, oh, I get it. So my question is, what do people get when they're around us? What kind of atmosphere is around you? Change your atmosphere and change your future. Jesus was very careful about who he allowed in his space. Jesus, you remember the times Jesus said, unless you do this, you can't be my disciple. Unless you do that, you can't be my disciple. I wonder if it was not so much because they were bad people. It was because whatever they had, if they weren't willing to change and weren't willing to deal with the things in their life, they were going to affect the other disciples and affect how people felt about his ministry. If you're controlled by the things you possess, Jesus said, you can't be my disciple. Jesus said, if you're not willing to leave everything and follow me, you can't be my disciple. Because Jesus is controlling the atmosphere and the people that are around him. What atmosphere have you created around yourself and what needs to change for 2018? Have you set a a list of maybe two, three, four guidelines that you use as criteria to be able to say, you can't be in my future unless you, number one, number two, and number three. If you change your atmosphere, this is prophetic, I'm telling you. You need to get this. If you, if you change the atmosphere, you can change your future. Some of us, the problem in our lives, the reason that we're not experiencing the future we thought we would is because the ap- of the atmosphere that we have created or that we have allowed to be created for us. If you don't do anything about your, ad- your uh, atmosphere, there's going to be one around you. It just won't be intentional. Now, there are things in our atmosphere that we don't want. In Acts chapter 9, verse 1, in the Weiss Greek translation, it says it like this. Listen to this. Saul, 
breathing in a personally produced atmosphere of threatening and slaughter. Talking about him persecuting Christians. Saul, who became Paul. And this, this Greek translation says that Saul breathed in a personally produced atmosphere. We personally produce an atmosphere around ourselves that we actually breathe in. I was fascinated. I can tell you don't care about that. What, what atmosphere have we personally produced? Galatians chapter 6 verse 15 in the Message Bible says that we can be set free from the stifling atmosphere. Everybody say atmosphere. We can be set free from the stifling atmosphere of pleasing others and fitting into the little patterns that they dictate. By being people pleasers instead of God pleasers, we create a stifling atmosphere. Where we can't be free to serve God. Everybody say, change your atmosphere. Change your future. Say it again. Change your atmosphere. Change your future. Say, I'm changing my atmosphere. And I'm changing my future. Now, there are four areas that the Holy Spirit spoke to me about the church when I, when I first got this and that, that I'm going to be processing with our leadership team. But then that I want to go through those same four areas with you, four areas that the Holy Spirit spoke to me about changing our atmosphere. And listen, there are myriads of them. And when I think about changing the atmosphere around me, I can come up with 10 things, 15 things. But I'm not going to get sidetracked. I'm going to stay on what the Holy Spirit said. Four areas he said. Yeah, but what about this area? Nope, these things. So let's look at those four, okay? Number one, expectation. Your expectation will form an atmosphere around you. In Acts chapter 3, verse 11... Actually, it's verse 1. Acts chapter 3, verse 1, Peter and John are going to the uh, temple to pray. And as they walk by, they walk by a man who has been lame from birth. And the Bible says that the man looked at Peter and John and he expected to receive something from them. So my question to you is, what do we expect to receive. What do you expect to receive from this church service today? Did you, did you come prepared to, to write anything down? Did you, I, I advertised on social media and everything, hey, I got a prophetic word. Was it important enough to you to write this down? To take some notes on your, uh, uh, your mobile device? How, how important? What did you expect to receive? What did you, what do you expect? We're going to worship in just a few moments. My question is, what do you expect to receive? What do we expect to happen in our family? What you expect to happen in 2018 and beyond will have a huge bearing in large part on what you actually receive. What you expect. What do you expect in your family? What do you expect to happen in 2018 in your workplace, in your business, in your church? What do you expect to happen? Let me ask you this. What should we expect in 2018? Do you have great expectation? 2018. Say it, 2018. It's going to be a great year for me. It's going to be a great year in my family. It's going to be a great year in my business. It's going to be a great year in my church. See, we need to expect that. What do you expect? I love, I love movie trailers. Because movie trailers tell me what to expect. Nobody goes to a movie without expecting what it's going to be about. Now, I have been surprised. Oh, I thought it was going to go this way, and it was going to go that way, and it went that way instead. But I at least have some idea of what to expect when I go. Do you have any expectation for your future in 2018? Or, well, let's just see what the future holds. No, I have great expectation for 2018, and I have great expectation for you. What do you expect? What should we expect? Let's talk about some things we should expect. Number one, we should expect the favor of God. Amen. Psalm chapter 512 says that the favor of God goes before us as a shield, and you should expect God's favor, favor in 2018. That where you go, God opens doors of opportunity for you. 
doors of blessing, doors of opportunity to minister to people and to bless people, doors of opportunity for his blessing to flow to you. You should expect God's favor. Second of all, you should expect that every seed you have sown produces the intended harvest. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says, He who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. Have you sown bountifully? That's three people. Everybody else is going, I'm not sure. All right, well, let me tell you this. Uh, Philippians 4, no, it's not Philippians 4. It's Galatians chapter 6 says that don't be deceived. God is not mocked. So whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. So you can expect that if you haven't sown much, you're not going to reap much. You can expect that. Or you can expect if you've sown bountifully, you're going to reap bountifully. You can expect that. You can, you can expect the whatever, that every seed that you have sown is going to come to fruition. And it's going to produce the intended harvest. Let me ask you this question. Have you kept up with it? If I ask you how much, and I'm talking financially. Is that okay? Talk about how much have you sown in 2017 for you, toward your future in 2018? How much have you sown? Do you know? Is there a place you can find out? Do you have a record of it? Can you, can you look? Would it, take you, would it take you 45 minutes to an hour to calculate it all? Or can you say, no, I'm expecting this because this is what I've sown. You ask any farmer that's sown a seed and he can tell you how many pounds of seed he's sown in his field and what harvest he expects. Can you? We should expect that every seed we've sown produces its intended harvest. Number three, we should expect the manifestation of our words. Mark eleven twenty three, Jesus said, "Whatever, you, whenever, uh, that when you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and you don't doubt in your heart, but you believe that those things which you say will come to pass, you will have whatever you say. So we should expect that our words, whether they're good words or bad words, Jesus didn't say, you're going to reap the good words, but you won't reap the bad words. He said, whatever you say, you're going to get it. And that's what we should expect in 2018. Well, 2017, I've been saying this, I've been saying this, I've been saying this. That's what you can expect. Your words, one reason why your words are important is they reveal to the spiritual realm and to everybody around you what you actually expect. And fourthly, we should expect to be delivered from the expectations of our enemies. You know, there are, uh, you should expect to be delivered from the expectations of your enemies. Uh, Newsflash, there are people that don't like you. Not everybody, I, I, I've said this before, if you've been in the church for a while, you've heard me say this before, but I remember when I came, because I used to, as a pastor, my, my, I wanted to please God, but second to pleasing God was I wanted to be sure everybody liked me, and I was devastated when, if I found out somebody didn't like me. And of course, when you're the senior pastor and people don't like you, then they attack you. It's one to say, you know, it's one thing if people can take you or leave you. It's, a one, it's another thing if people don't like you, and then they feel like they have to attack you. And I, I just hated that. Still, I still don't like it. I still hate it. But I, I remember when I, re, when I realized not everybody's going to like me. And, you know, some of us have enemies that are not excited about our progress. They're not excited about our harvest. They're not excited about God's blessing in our life. They're not excited about seeing us accomplish God's purpose and plan in our life. There are people, there are some of us who have enemies. Do any of you have enemies? That's several of us have enemies. Well, Paul said, Acts chapter 12, verse 11, actually it was uh, Peter. Peter, when he had come to himself, Acts 12, 11, he said, now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. There are people that expect you to fail. Guess what? Too bad because 2018 is going to be your best year. It's going to be your best year. If you think they were fascinated by 2017, you wait till 2018 rolls around and God blesses you and blesses you and blesses you. And, the, and Psalm 23 says that he puts out a table before you in the presence of your enemies. He doesn't just bless you. He does it in the presence of your enemies. 
so they can hang, hang their heads and go, boy, was I, was I an idiot. The first thing you need to go into 2018 with, you need to create an atmosphere of expectation. I expect God to move. I expect things to happen. I expect mountains to move. I expect things to change. I expect God to bless me wherever I go. Secondly, we need to create an atmosphere of excellence. Create an atmosphere of excellence. This is what the Holy Spirit showed me to share with you. Excellence. Excellence is not perfection. Excellence is doing the very best you can with what you have. Can I just say to you, to some of you, if I could just be so bold as to say this, soap and water is cheap. Paint is cheap. There are a lot of things that it takes to maintain excellence. Most of the things that it takes to maintain a, uh, an atmosphere of excellence are not expensive. We just need some initiative and some elbow grease. This is not going anywhere, is it? Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> While excellence manifests itself in how we keep our homes and our cars, how we dress, and how we do our work, excellence is a cultivated spirit, not a one-time event. There are people that are going to hear this message, and you're going to go home, and you're going to clean out your garage, and you're going to wash your car, and you're going to, and you're going to do all this stuff because you want to have excellence, and it's going to be a one-time event this afternoon. Excellence is a spirit that you cultivate. I'm going to do the very best I can with what I have. People of excellence are not OCD. Or actually CDO. The letters need to be in alphabetical order. CDO. Uh. <laughs> People of excellence are not OCD. Although I am a little bit, but... People of excellence are not necessarily OCD. They just understand the law of attraction. That excellence attracts excellent people. If you want excellent people to work in your business, your business needs to be a business of excellence. If you want excellent people to be attracted to your ministry, your ministry needs to be a ministry of excellence. If you want your children to maintain, you know, we harp at our children to clean their rooms up. My question is, what does the rest of the house look like? In 1 Kings chapter 10, we have the account of the queen of Sheba who had heard of the wisdom of Solomon and she goes to visit Solomon and she sits down and asks him all of these deep questions and the Bible says that she's fascinated by his wisdom and then after that verse 3 says this is 1st Kings chapter 10 verse 3 Solomon answered all her questions there was nothing nothing so difficult for the king that he could not explain it to her and when the queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon, the home that he had built, the food on his table, how his servants were seated, how his waiters served, even the clothes of the waiters and the clothes of his cupbearers, and even the entryway by, when you went, by which you went up to the house of the Lord. There was no more spirit in her. She was floored by the excellence that she saw. Excellence is a spirit. I, uh, I, we ride uh, motorcycles with, uh, uh, with the motorcycle meetup. If you've got a motorcycle, you've got to ride with us. It's a lot of fun. And uh, the guy who leads the motorcycle meetup is, is uh, Ben Honeycutt. And uh, I've never seen anybody maintain motor vehicles like Ben Honeycutt. Uh, we, were, we were out riding, and... Uh, we all, we all stopped for lunch, and Ben gets out, and uh, when we all get off our bikes, and Ben, I go over there, and Ben's got this spray bottle, and he's spraying his windshield. I said, what's the matter? He said, I've got a bug on my windshield, and he's got, he's got these cleaning supplies in his, in his saddlebags, and he's, he's getting a, I looked over at my windshield. It's covered with bugs. <laughs> he's got this one. Am I right, Earl? Earl rides with him, am I right? And he's, he's cleaning that bug off. And then, oh, there's a spot on his fender. So now he's got another cleaning supply for that. I love it, though. I love the excellence with which he maintains what he has. And it's contagious. I went home, cleaned my windshield, washed that bike up, cleaned my bike. Not a one-time event? No, no. I do, now I do it all the time. 
I didn't appreciate that comment, though, because now you... <laughs> oh, no. Now, now, now I... What I work on... Connie and Steve got a, uh, a road king for Christmas for each other, didn't we? And uh, what, I spent five hours cleaning that thing up, at least. Took the whole thing apart, cleaned it up. Uh, Exodus chapter 15, verse 7 even says, listen to this, God overthrows his enemies in the greatness of his excellence. God even overthrows his enemies with excellence. I like that. You deal with your enemies with excellence? I mean, if you're going to slap them, do it with excellence. (laughs) Number three, to balance out what I just said about slapping your enemies, number three is creating an atmosphere of acceptance. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 6 through 7 says, To the praise of the glory of His grace, by which He has made us accepted in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. We have been accepted according to the riches of God's undeserved favor, not according to how well we have done. We want to create an attitude of acceptance of others, even if they don't measure up to our standard, as long as they measure up to His. Create an atmosphere of acceptance, not an atmosphere of strife. Learn to accept people where they are as God works on them. There are people that don't meet up, they don't measure up to our standards and where we think they should be. But if they're growing and they're learning and they're working on it, then let's be accepting of people. And let's be a blessing to people. Why is it to Christians, as far as the world is concerned, Christians are known for what we're against, not what we're for. And we need to be a blessing to people. Now, listen, sin is sin, and there are things out there that are sin. We're not saying that, it's, that sin's okay, it's okay to sin. We're not saying that at all. But we're, what we're saying is that there is sin in the life of people, and we need to love the people while they're dealing with the sin in their life while God's dealing with that. The woman who was caught in adultery. Jesus Jesus told her, uh, I don't condemn you. I want you to go. Stop sinning. But I don't condemn you. Jesus didn't condone. He didn't say, oh, you're a prostitute. It's okay. Everybody's got something they're dealing with. You're all right. Jesus said, you need to stop that. But I don't condemn you. I love you. The Pharisees were the ones that wanted to condemn. We need to create an atmosphere of acceptance. That we love people. When you create that atmosphere, God, there are people that other people are, that are condemning that God might want to use in your future. There is a time to cut people loose. And I want to, you know, because some of, we got people in the ditch on one side or the other. We got people that, that they don't have, they don't have time for anybody. If you don't measure up to my standard, I ain't got time for you. Then we got people that will, that will let people practically drag them to hell. There are times to cut people loose. So let me give you the main three of those. Number one, when you want to help a person more than they want to help themselves. Know any of those people? I want to help them. And as a pastor, I'm so guilty of that. I see potential in people and I want to help them. They could do so well. But they don't want to help themselves. I can't help them. And you need to know when to cut that person loose. Number two, when your attempts to help someone result in your drowning rather than lifting them up. And then the third one, when they begin to feel as though you are their problem. That's the time to cut them loose. But most of the people in our lives, most of the people that we experience, you know, we we need to be a blessing to them and we need to love people and accept them. And, you know, as far as the church is concerned, I found this on Facebook and it was probably one of you that posted it, but I want to read this to you. I I happened to see this yesterday and there are people that aren't here, won't, are not going to be here today that won't ever be here again that I wish could hear this. If you left the church to get away from hypocritical people, You should also quit your job, drop out of school, disconnect yourself from all your friends and family, lock yourself in your room while you're at it. There will be flaws wherever there are humans. We need to start seeing church for what it is. It's a hospital with wounded and hurt people. You will find messed up, conniving, calculating, imperfect individuals, including yourself. 
I thought that was good. As much as you want to deny it, we all go for healing. So if you felt betrayed by a fellow church member, put your nursing cap on and think of them as your patients. Treat them with care, love, and kindness despite their rudeness. Let's develop an atmosphere of acceptance. And fourthly, the last one, you need to develop an atmosphere of anointing. Isaiah chapter 10 Verse 27 says, It shall come to pass in that day that his burden will be taken away from your shoulder and his yoke from your neck, and the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing. The power of God to remove burdens and destroy yokes in the lives of others is what people should experience when they are around you. Is this, is this what people experience? What do people experience? The power and the anointing of God to deliver them and set them free. In Luke chapter 4, verse 18, describes Jesus' anointing. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. Everybody say anointed. anointed. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus said, I am anointed too, and he lists all the things he was anointed to do. My question is, what's the anointing on your life, and what are you anointed to do? Because people need to experience that in the atmosphere around you. And when you speak, and when you share, and when you love, and when you bless someone else, that anointing to remove burdens and destroy yokes. Imagine the anointing in the atmosphere around Jesus. Can you imagine walking with Jesus, just being like three feet away from Jesus? There were people that said, Jesus, that asked Jesus, can we follow you? I want to follow you. Can I follow you? And Jesus was very careful about his atmosphere. Yes, you can follow me if you'll do this. You can follow me if you'll do that. Can you imagine the anointing in the atmosphere around Jesus? Just imagine that, what it, would, what it was like to be around him, to walk with him. I imagine it felt like being around a power line. Well, guess what? He lives in you. So what do people sense when they're around you? Do they sense the anointing of God? Acts chapter 10 verse 38 says how God anointed. I would say anointed again. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. The Message Bible says Jesus arrived from, Naz arrived from Nazareth. Anointed by God with the Holy Spirit. Ready for action. Isn't that great? Are you ready for action with the anointing of the Holy Spirit on you? And then 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. For all the promises of God in him are yes and in him amen to the glory of God through us. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ has anointed us. Us, anointed us. Not just Jesus' is anointing, he's anointed us. Say, I am anointed. I want you to stand with me, please. And I want you to say this, I am changing the atmosphere around me, and I'm changing my future. I have great expectation for 2018. It's going to be a great year. I speak it, and I expect it. I'm going to create an atmosphere of excellence around me, not perfection, but I'm going to do the very best I can with everything I have. I'm going to create an atmosphere of acceptance. I'm going to love and accept those who need encouragement. And then I'm going to create an atmosphere of anointing. For the power of God to move through me and around me as people are touched with the presence of God in my life. Would you just close your eyes and lift your hands right now? God, we thank you. We thank you for your anointing, God, and your power on our lives. 2018 is going to be a great year for us, but we're going to change the atmosphere. We're going to change the atmosphere around us, in our homes, in our workplaces. We're going to change the atmosphere and change our future. 
We're going to change the atmosphere in our church. We're going to change the atmosphere in our neighborhood. We're going to change the atmosphere and see the atmosphere shift and move right into the power and the blessing of God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Say this after me. Holy Spirit, breathe on me. Breathe on my future. Breathe on me. Breathe on my 2018. Breathe on me. Allow me to be the influence in my world that you created me to be in 2018. Let's worship God together.